Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Heinzfeld on this special day for him. Today is Professor Heinzfeld's uh, birthday, and he will want, we want to he wanted to share this date with us uh, and accepted our invitation to uh, to lecture in this important day. My deepest uh, gratitude and my best wishes for this day. I have first met Professor Stephen Einsfield during my six-month PhD internship at the Obesity Research Center, St. Luke's Roosevelt, Columbia University in 2004. It was an exceptional opportunity to be mentored by such an outstanding scientist that, that I admire since I started studying the human, human body composition research area. Uh, he also integrates the external advisory board of CPED. Dr. Eimsfield is a physician scientist and a professor at Pennington Biomedical Research Center in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, United States of America. He is a, grad, he is a graduate of the ICANN School of Medicine in New York, and he trained in internal medicine at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, also, Dr. Eimsfield uh, then assumed uh, a faculty position at Columbia University School of Medicine and with his college there, he developed new body composition models and methods. He has continued his research on body composition and energy metabolism while holding the position of professor at Pennington. And meanwhile, he was also executive director at Merck. Dr. Eimsfield has published more than 600 peer review papers and he has served as the president of the three major US nutrition societies, HASPEN, ASCN, and most, most recently, the Obesity Society. So uh, the, the Zoom is yours, Professor Antti. Well, in the uh, presentation today, I'd like to take a journey through the area of body composition and energy expenditure research and give you an idea of where the field is going today. And if we uh, step back a bit, we, we think about our shape, our body shape, uh, and that can be defined by many factors, such as our height, our age, our race, our genes, our activity and diet, hormones, drugs, many factors affect our shape. But everybody's shape is distinct. No two people have the same shape. Uh, just as no two people have the same uh, iris or the same fingerprint, it's unique to each of us. And what you'll see in uh, my presentation is we're moving towards a time where we can define very accurately individual differences in body shape and how they relate to variation in body composition, which is what determines shape, and in turn, how those affect or, uh, factors affect things like our health risks, our athletic performance, our metabolism, and particularly our energy expenditure. And I'll focus uh, a bit uh, on the link between body composition, shape, and energy expenditure as we move forward. And today, as you know, uh, at least in the clinical world, our methods of quantifying shape are very crude. We can measure weight and height as a fact function of body size, and we can measure waist circumference. These are all size measures. And we can uh, take various indices such as BMI and make them into shape indices but this is very rudimentary and we'll see how that field is evolving very quickly. Uh, as I said, uh, we're, we're going to overview body composition and energy expenditure, how they're related and talk a little bit about some future directions. Now, if we uh, take our crudest uh, shape measure, which is body mass index, weight divided by height squared, we know it relates to uh, body fat. So this is just a plot of uh, men in the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey of uh, percent fat versus their BMI. And you can see it's a curve that the two are related to each other, but there's a lot of individual variability uh, at any single BMI, like this BMI here, I put in it, uh, about a BMI of 25. We can see that if people fall above the curve, uh, that means they're fatter than uh, the average. And if they fall below the curve, they're more muscular than average. And so right off, we know that measures such as BMI are very crude indices. 
And what we'll see are the improving ways of quantifying uh, body size, shape, and composition uh, as we move forward. And of course, then we get people who have a very low BMI, but nevertheless are muscular. And likewise, people who have a high BMI and who are also muscular. So we know that there are many, many different phenotypes that are involved with uh, human body size and shape and measures such as BMI are quite primitive. Now the work in this field began almost exactly 100 years ago by the uh, Czech uh, anthropologist, Hendra Shmatiega, who uh, first uh, began to try and unravel how functional capacity in soldiers is related to their body composition. And he used uh, calipers and rulers to uh, develop a model that divided the body into muscle, bone, adipose tissue, uh, skin, and other body components. So that's one century ago, uh, we, can, we were using these, what we call today primitive tools to divide body mass into these compartments that in turn related to body function. And that work uh, was advanced with the discovery of x-rays by Rankin in 1895. Uh, scientists like uh, Richard Stewart, Stewart in the 1940s used x-rays uh, that uh, Rankin developed uh, or certainly discovered to measure the widths of soft tissue on each side of the bone. So this is an example of um, muscle and adipose tissue. He measured these widths, uh, particularly in children, using x-rays to quantify their level of adiposity and muscularity. Not really that long ago. Uh, perhaps one of the most important advances was Albert Benke, uh, uh, who was a Navy uh, scientist in the US. In the early 1940s, uh, he developed the idea of the uh, two compartment model, dividing body weight into fat compartment and the fat free compartment. And Benke's idea was very simple. Uh, he said that fat has a density of 0.9 kilograms per liter and lean tissues have a density of 1.1 kilograms per liter. So that uh, if you were all fat, you would float in water because uh, water has a density of one. And if you were all muscle, you would sink in water if you blew out all of, all of your air. And he developed a simple model and he uh, used underwater weighing or hydrodensitometry to quantify body volume. And from your weight and volume, you get body density and thereby uh, Benke's simple model, this is his two compartment model shown here, he could divide the body into these two components. And uh, that was uh, amplified around the same time by uh, Rathbun and Pace, 1945, uh, developing isotopic methods of measuring total body water. Uh, when they uh, examined total body water, across a very wide range of species. So shown here, it's a little hard to see, but they found all the way from mouse to uh, goat to human, the seal, that uh, there was a linear correlation between total body water and fat-free mass. And uh, therefore the ratio of uh, total body water to fat-free mass was almost constant across all animals at a, approximately 0.73. And from that idea, then uh, they could use these different isotopes of water, tritium, uh, deuterium, and oxygen-18 water, uh, give you a dose of water, measure your total body water compartment. And from that, they could calculate fat-free mass and fat mass using these simple equations. That was a huge advance also, because then uh, body composition could be measured also without underwater weighing with just an isotope of water. Perhaps the most important advance, and certainly in my world, is uh, 1971. Godfrey Hansfield took uh, Rankin's simple x-rays uh, and created a scanning device as we now know it today, computerized tomography. And by 1975, these um, methods, uh, CT scanners, become, became available clinically. And on the right, you see this uh, early digital printout of a person's image from Hansfield's uh, experimental CT scanner. And today, of course, uh, we can get great images. Uh, this is uh, actually quite an early image showing 
visceral adipose tissue, subcutaneous adipose tissue, muscle, and these different compartments. And uh, from these images, then you can use software and get the volume of each compartment. You can quantify total body adipose tissue and total body muscle in a scan of the uh, extremities uh, shown here in this very simple example. And so that we're gonna come back to CT in a minute, but that was a huge advance because now we could see inside the body and quantify compartments that previously had been unobtainable to us, such as visceral adipose tissue, muscle, bone, other compartments. Around the same time, uh, Richard Mazes, uh, an anthropologist very interested in bone mass, developed the technique called dual photon absorptiometry. And he used an isotope, uh, gadolinium, to quantify two, uh, three compartments, actually, uh, bone, lean soft tissue, and fat, three components, uh, from the dual uh, energies emitted by gadolinium. This is Dr. Mazes, and it shows some of his uh, early uh, tools that he used uh, for developing th this technology. That was dual photon absorptiometry. And here's a scan of Dr. Mazes showing uh, the two-dimensional image of his body using an X-ray and his three compartments, fat, lean, soft tissue, and bone. And people thought, oh, this will never work. This just, uh, there are too many theoretical objections. And I know Dr. Mazes very well, and he pioneered through those criticisms. And today, of course, by the 1990s, they replaced the isotope uh, uh, gadolinium with uh, X-ray source uh, that produced two energy peaks. And now we could produce clearer images of the body and deconvolute it into these three compartments. And then today we have large scanners that we can study people with obesity. And uh, this is a particularly large scanner made by Norland but as most of you know, uh, DEXA has almost become the gold standard method. Uh, you know, there's some concerns about calling it a gold standard, but nevertheless, it's become the tool almost all research and clinical centers use for studying people with obesity. Now, what DEXA did was very important because now we could measure bone mineral. A lot of people have tried for many decades to measure bone in people because bone's an independent determinant of body composition, body shape. And now we could uh, create what's called a four component model in which the body mass is divided, not in just uh, yeah. fat and, is that okay? Fat and fat free mass, but we could also measure total body water with isotope dilution and bone mineral with DEXA. This just shows these four components uh, that are uh, quantified using this uh, multi-component model, some of the equations involved. And uh, as you see, uh, we went from the underwater weighing today more to uh, uh, things like air displacement uh, plethysmography, bod pod. And so many research centers around the world, including I know where Annalisa works, uh, use this four component approach to quantify body fat, uh, and fat-free mass because it relies on very few assumptions about the density of the different body compartments. So this is quite, a, quite an advance uh, today. Now, another uh, very, very important advance, which I'll talk more about uh, in a minute, is that uh, at least seven or possibly even eight Nobel Prizes have been awarded for magnetic resonance imaging and magnetic resonance spectroscopy all the way from uh, Isidore Rabbi to uh, Kurt Wuthrich uh, more recently, these Nobel Prizes set the groundwork for what we now today as uh, uh, MRI. This is uh, Lauterberg's original paper, half a page long in uh, Nature, in which he uh, got the Nobel Prize for showing that he could reconstruct a 3D image from a nuclear magnetic resonance scan. And uh, this is uh, Demadian's early MRI scanner. Uh, hard to imagine, he actually built a device like this, but this is 1974, the first uh, MRI scanner, uh, very rudimentary. And today, uh, uh, not long after 
by the 1990s, we had very excellent MRI scanners, Selberg and others first started using it for body composition. <clears throat> and today we have extremely powerful MRI scanners that we can do whole body scans. Now, this is just one example of how MRI can be used for body composition. Uh, this is a whole body scan. You scan someone head to toe, you get uh, all of the 2D cross-sectional images as you show here. And then you use software by hand and you can uh, quantify the various adipose tissue compartments and skeletal muscle. This just shown here, you uh, paint in these different regions. And from that, uh, you can then uh, reconstruct the 3D image of the person shown here. Now there's a time not that long ago where this would be considered uh, quite miraculous that you could do this, quantify all these tissue organ components in the body. <clears throat> but the advances have been spectacular. So for example, <clears throat> we have a newer sequencing approach called the Dixon method or water fat imaging. So instead of doing these slices up and down the body like that, very tedious, you can quantify uh, images that are rich in water and images are rich in fat. And you can use that approach to do very fast scans, only a 10 minute scan of the whole body. And that then in turn allows us to develop automated methods. And this is a uh, image developed by the company AMRA. This is all automated. It takes away the tedious segmentation approach. And uh, you can see now you can get individual muscle groups, individual adipose tissue groups. And uh, this almost seemed miraculous just a few years ago to be able to do this in an automated way. But now it's advancing even more, much faster because of artificial intelligence. Here's a, an image uh, just sent to me by, by a colleague, a commercial company called Voroni Health Analytics. Uh, this is a whole body CT scan uh, automated using artificial intelligence. Uh, CT whole body are often done with uh, PET scans for cancer. But you can see now uh, within just a few years, we'll be able to put through uh, people in an MRI scanner quickly, very short scan and get a whole body image, uh, quantify many different body components. Now, the early workers uh, in body composition often considered primarily mass or volume compartments, like the volume of fat or the volume of uh, adipose tissue. But today, uh, there's much more interest in quality. So with techniques such as MRI, <clears throat> we can uh, get uh, ectopic lipids, for example, using spectroscopy at the same time as we create an image. Uh, for example, we can get liver, fat, the triglyceride within hepatocytes. This is uh, renal adipose tissue, perinephric adipose tissue, pancreatic uh, adipose tissue, and so on. And we can get other compartments, of course, like visceral adipose tissue. And we can get intramuscular adipose tissue or intramyocellular lipids. So we've gone way beyond just measuring the total mass of these compartments. We can also measure their quality we can quantify different uh, types of fat tissue, such as white fat, uh, brown fat, uh, to some extent beige fat, using imaging technology, not just radioactive techniques such as uh, PET scan, but with uh, MRI and MR spectroscopy. Now, moving on from these very high power uh, complex methods, there's another field that's uh, moving very fast, uh, and that is uh, digital anthropometry. This is called a uh, uh, Loughborough scanner uh, developed in 1989, originally uh, aimed to develop uh, scans for clothing fitting, uh, particularly uh, sweaters in, in UK, uh, other types of clothing. But uh, the investigators in this uh, shadow scanner, as they call it, clearly saw the potential for digital anthropometry and thereby quantifying not just lengths or circumferences, but use it to derive estimates of body composition. And fast forward uh, another decade or so, laser scanners came on that could, uh, much more sophisticated than that original scanner, uh, using both computers and laser scans. One could, uh, in a few seconds, scan the whole body with lasers, 
and get a uh, body volume and regional body measurements from that. And then uh, another uh, few years later, out came these other uh, imaging systems. These are all 3D optical imaging systems uh, based on varying technologies that in a minute or certainly less than a minute, a few seconds in some cases, you can get a complete avatar of the human body. Uh, these just show the different principles. Each of these scanners works on a different approach, but the cost of those scanners is one-tenth or one-twentieth that of a laser scanner. They're very inexpensive. And so uh, that technology has been proliferating. And today we can do even more. We can quantify using 2D images. These are 2D images uh, on a green screen of a person. We can use that data to develop cell phone apps uh, that can be used then to quantify total body fat, uh, total body um, muscle and other body compartments. So this is just a simple example. It's already a little old. But uh, in a recent survey, we found that there are uh, at least 15 or 20 apps that you can get for a cell phone that allow you to take a 2D photograph, maybe several photographs. And from that, it'll quantify body size and shape and composition. This is the most recent one we work with. It's called the Halo. I'm wearing one now. It's just a little band and it, it uh, links to your uh, cell phone camera and uh, it, uh, gives you reasonably accurate estimates of waist circumference, arm circumferences, and uh, various estimates of body shape. And you can uh, use the avatar, then you can project out what you would look like if you gain weight or lose a little weight. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, uh, the digital anthropometry, it uh, creates an avatar, at least the 3D systems create avatars that look like this. And from the avatar then, uh, automated systems can quantify hundreds of different circumferences, lengths, and volumes, even surface area reasonably accurately. This is just a small sample of the types of measurements that you get from uh, the scanners. And uh, that uh, on the upper part of this panel then, what happens is you get a file when you scan the person called an OBJ file. Uh, automat uh, automated software then can give you estimates of uh, regional volumes like the volume of the leg, uh, can give you the surface area of the leg, it give you all the circumference measurements. And then in turn, you can use that data to predict body composition using empirical regression equations or you can predict health risk markers such as insulin, uh, HDL cholesterol, other markers like that. That's sort of way, where the current state of the art is. So it works up in that upper part of the panel. Now in the lower part of the panel, uh, we have approaches either by hand or uh, automated approaches for putting landmarks on people, it's different points. And those landmarks then can be used to tie your body size and shape to a template. And these templates then are based on perhaps a million scans of different people. Uh, they're huge libraries. So we can tie your shape to a standardized shape. And from that, we can also uh, use techniques so, such as uh, principal component analysis to give you an estimate of your shape, not just your circumference, but uh, several different numbers that define your shape. And what we have yet to do is uh, segregate people into the many different shape type uh, components. There's far more than the apple and the pear shape, uh, of course, uh, in the world. There are many different shapes. And so that's where we are now. But the other approach that this allows you to do then is it allows you to link these standardized images to, for example, a DEXA scan. And we can develop regression models then from your 3D shape, say from your cell phone, we can predict what your DEXA scan would look like. Uh, we can also predict what you would look like if you gained fat or lost fat. This is my colleague, uh, John Shepard. He has a BMI of 28, shown in the middle. This is his 3D optical scan. 
This is what uh, John would look like if we subtracted 20 kilograms of fat from him, or if we gained 20 kilograms of fat from him. These are just simple regression models, this technique called manifold regression. And uh, here's John, if we put 20 kilograms of lean on, or uh, we did various combinations. So we can model these uh, quite easily. Uh, these are not really publicly available uh, software programs yet, but within one or two years, you'll be able to get uh, software like this because many people are working on it. And here's a DEXA scan. Uh, this is the actual DEXA on the left. Uh, the predicted DEXA on the right. That's from a 3D optical scan. And this just shows the difference. Uh, that's a man and this is one of a woman. And so we, we're getting much, much closer using uh, artificial intelligence and so on that we can predict what your DEXA scan would look like just from a 3D optical scan or from a 2D scan using a cell phone. Here's a little example I thought you might be interested in. This is a pay, uh, study we did with a group at Harvard, uh, David Ludwig, uh, principal investigator. He took these overweight men, uh, BMI of 28 in this single case, and uh, this man lost uh, 16 kilograms or so. His BMI went from almost 29 to about 24. And this is the actual 3D optical scan. You can see a marked difference in the way he looked. Uh, he almost looks a little bit thin on the right, whereas he's in the normal range. Now I'll show you the scan we predicted from his height, weight, and age. Uh, this on the left shows would be the baseline scan. And then uh, on the right is the uh, predicted scan. So you can see this is just an N of one. We did pretty well uh, comparing uh, what he was in the beginning to what he would look like you can develop regression models like this so you could make them more sophisticated. You could put someone's race in your sex, uh, your percent fat, height, all these variables then, and you'll be able to predict these different avatars, what people do look like or will look like with interventions. So just to summarize uh, quickly body composition, then we have body composition at all these different levels. Each level sums up to body weight. And today we have all of these methods. We can quantify uh, body composition using high tech methods all the way down to very simple techniques, uh, such as calipers, even bioimpedance analysis, which I didn't talk about. Uh, methods are very powerful. And one of the things that's happening then is that all of this data, these on the bottom, we just see a few uh, optical scanners, uh, shown here, this is a DEXA scan. That data then can be uploaded into the cloud, making huge databases. We know the million person study in the US, uh, the uh, UK biobank study, uh, NHANE studies. We can put all that data into the cloud. As long as it's good quality, we can put these optical images in. And from that, we can use machine learning software or artificial intelligence uh, technologies to then develop body composition models, energy expenditure models, risk prediction models, and so on. That's going to be the major change. We won't need to use any of these uh, very rudimentary models developed uh, maybe 50, even 100 years ago to predict, predict things. And uh, I'm gonna move, move on. Uh, so, the uh, other component then is body composition relates to energy expenditure. Uh, back in the 1600s, we had alchemy. Uh, the alchemists thought that uh, heat was a spontaneous uh, generation from the heart and had uh, no underlying physical chemical principle. Uh, this is uh, George Stahl who uh, had those views in the 1700s. Uh, the so-called phlogiston theory that uh, you're, you had this phlogiston substance and it burned and uh, used up and that's why the candle would extinguish. So uh, it, it took Lavoisier uh, in the mid 1700s then to first uh, understand heat production. And this just shown uh, Lavoisier's uh, rudimentary calorimeter. And Lavoisier of course first understood that heat is generated by combustion, just like a candle, and that uh, 
oxygen is consumed in the process, CO2 is generated, and it's identical to combustion. And Lavoisier developed uh, some tools. These are first human studies by Lavoisier looking at uh, the effects of exercise and diet on uh, energy expenditure in people. And that was an enormous transformation. And today we know that energy uh, metabolism, the heat in our body, just like a candle, comes from the oxidation of protein, fat, and carbohydrate. And in turn, that's uh, fueled by the food we eat, the oxygen we breathe, and heat is given off uh, as our end products, uh, carbon dioxide, water, and urea. That's our current concept of uh, metabolism. And heat is given off in different ways, such as radiation, convection, and so on. Now, uh, fast forward another uh, couple of hundred years. Uh, and, and then now today we understand that the heat generated in the body emanates almost entirely from mitochondria, oxidation of uh, metabolic fuels in mitochondria within cells, and that in turn uh, generates ATP, and that uh, that ATP is then used in protein synthesis, uh, maintaining cellular gradients, glucose production, urea production, and so on. So we understand the heat production the metabolic rate in people at a very uh, high level in terms of biochemical mechanisms. And likewise, if we take that idea and we move to the whole body, and I just show the tissue organ level here, the whole body, a, a cross-sectional image of a person with an MRI scan, we know that that uh, heat production then is generated by the protein synthesis uh, and other biochemical reactions I mentioned earlier at the cell level. And then in turn, our body composition measures uh, at the different levels. For example, at the tissue organ level, we have adipose tissue and adipose tissue free mass. At the uh, molecular level, we have fat and fat free mass, the two compartment models, and body weight at the whole body level. And when you put all those levels together, you can see that we generate heat. This is, would be our basal heat production or resting energy expenditure involves this entire process. And what we know is that the amount of heat you generate is related to your body size and shape shown on the left. So uh, if you're uh, obese uh, and have a high level of adiposity, that in turn translates all through the system and has an effect on your body composition. And likewise, if you're muscular. And today we can unravel all of these pieces at a very high level. We still can't do very well at the cellular level, but at least we can measure all of the body organs with uh, MRI. And we can measure uh, all these other compartments using uh, some of the body composition methods uh, I mentioned earlier. And what we know that for the most part, there's a strong correlation between the amount of heat you produced at rest, uh, resting energy expenditure, and your lean mass. Uh, fat has a very low metabolic rate. So that's oops, fat free mass. And uh, there's a linear correlation just shown in the red in women and men is resting metabolic rate and above it 24 hour energy expenditure. So we know there's a correlation between the two. But the other phenomenon that's of great interest now is that if uh, people go on a diet and they lose weight, there's a very prompt reduction in their energy expenditure, such, this, uh, such that this regression line uh, goes down. That is for any level of fat-free mass, people who lose weight, particularly during a diet period, have a lower heat production than uh, they would normally based on their fat-free mass or lean tissue compartment. And that's referred to as metabolic adaptation. And this is a real scientific uh, frontier. Uh, and here I just show on the right, a little uh, cartoon showing you're producing heat uh, at baseline. And then uh, when you lose weight, your heat production simply goes down relative to the amount of mass you have. So that's the adaptive thermogenesis or metabolic adaptation. And uh, this just shows a little uh, 
example uh, developed by Manfred Muller and I, uh, shown in the top, if uh, your weight is stable and you go on a diet, you're going to lose weight exponentially over time. It'll slowly slow down until you come to a new stable energy balance state. And what you see is you see this adaptive thermogenesis then uh, promptly increases. That is when uh, you lose weight, even early in dieting, your metabolic rate falls. And that appears to be a metabolic adaptation. And uh, this shown in the bottom here, your energy intake uh, dropping say to a fourth or a half of your normal metabolic uh, intake. So this uh, phenomenon of metabolic adaptation is of great interest and the National Institute of Health in the US is uh, commissioning several major studies to try and understand it. And there are huge gaps in our knowledge of how this works. And I'm just gonna show you some, uh, perhaps a little pathophysiology here. During the early weight loss phase, uh, Manfred uh, Muller, again at Keele University, Kristen Albrecht's University in Kiel, he looked at resting energy expenditure in uh, experimental volunteers. And he was able to show even the first week or two that there are loss of metabolically active tissues, particularly fat, muscle, kidney, and adipose tissue, that he could account for some of the metabolic adaptation he saw. But in addition, there are functional changes he thinks contributed to the metabolic adaptation. For example, your glomerular filtration rate in your kidney falls, your heart rate falls, and your core temperature falls. And you can calculate the amount of energy uh, that would be lowered because of these different uh, physiological effects. And he was able to account for all of the metabolic adaptation uh, using this approach. But what it really shows uh, in the context of my presentation is that uh, we can quantify these components of body composition. It's not easy, it's uh, complex and costly, but we can begin to understand some of these metabolic effects uh, that relate to body composition and energy expenditure and dieting using approaches like this. The great gap, the scientific gap we have is we're not yet able on a large practical scale to quantify an individual organ metabolic rate. That will be a, a great breakthrough. Now this last uh, panel then uh, tries to put uh, metabolic adaptation in uh, context. One theory says that when you lose weight and your metabolic rate falls, it's a uh, way to compensate for the uh, energy expended and uh, thereby save energy in the body. And that in turn, the signals that drive that predispose people to regain the weight. That's the set point theory. And uh, that is the compensation theory. Uh, competing theory is that in fact, uh, when you lose weight and you uh, feel hungry and you have these other metabolic effects, it's simply going from the obese state to the normal weight state, the so-called normalization theory and that uh, most people who are lean uh, ha feel hungry some of the time uh, as uh, driven by their various uh, neurological signals, whereas many people with obesity often do not feel hungry that they're in this uh, elevated uh, metabolic state. So this is the normalization theory. And I, I think over the next decade, using these uh, energy expenditure, metabolic technologies, body composition, we'll have a much deeper understanding of these effects. So I've traced through a lot, uh, Annalisa, and uh, I hope uh, perhaps you'll have a few questions. Thanks very much. Thanks for the outstanding presentation. Uh, in a quick overview, uh, I would like to congratulate uh, uh, Professor Eimsfield uh, for the effort of showing us uh, a short story of human body composition and energy uh, metabolism uh, methods and related concerns. You end your talk by explaining us the concept of uh, metabolic adaption or adaptive thermogenesis uh, yes. as a result, especially of diet induced weight loss, but also 
for those who, who try to maintain their reduced body weight, uh, which is still a concern because rapidly people regain the actual weight they, they lost. So it's this, con this energy that is conserved during the weight loss process is, uh, is an issue. In the past, it wasn't because it was a mechanism of, of sur uh, survive, surviving, uh, but nowadays it's uh, difficult to lose weight and to maintain the weight that was lost because exactly of this mechanism of energy um, conservation that we have, which is called the adaptive thermogenesis, as you showed. Uh, um, I remember that we, and you participated in that study, uh, we also can see in athletes we are able to, to also uh, see that uh, uh, over a season, especially in the triathletes, triathletes, which is a weight sensitive sport, uh, it is important to mention that uh, they, they, uh, they have a, a low energy availability, especially in the competitive phases. And we found, and you were an author of that uh, paper, we found an adaptive thermogenesis uh, decrease in resting energy expenditure that was observed in these three athletes only in this sport, uh, where they conserved 200 calories over the season. So it, mean, it means that uh, uh, they might be at risk given this uh, uh, low energy availability, they might, might be at risk of uh, uh, having the reproductive uh, function that is compromised and as well the bone mass may be compromised. So. Um, you highlighted such a important questions, and uh, this session now is open to, to questions, and I will be happy to highlight the questions placed on the chat. Uh, I will uh, now, if you want to ask any questions to Professor Einstein, please do it through chat. I'll be... Uh, and at least I could make a little comment also while we're waiting, uh, mm -hmm. and that is uh, the... Uh, uh, Reduction in energy expenditure in athletes uh, is is a form of metabolic adaptation, right? It's a form of metabolic adaptation, and uh, you can get amenorrhea in women, and you can get uh, bone loss and many other effects. So uh, it's it's a truly it's a way of the body adapting to just simply not enough energy. Do, do I understand that correctly? Exactly. Exactly. And uh, sometimes we think that exercise may be the answer for everything, but yeah. uh, uh, even though we we exercise during the weight loss uh, program, a, a exercise per se is not able to uh, avoid this metabolic adaptation that happens. Even uh -huh. I, I think that it may even um, uh, highlight it as 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 the the the, the, the studies performed with the, the biggest loser contests uh -huh. show uh, those that uh, performed that study or that those contests that, that lost a lot of weight using a massive lifestyle intervention with exercise as well, they have a higher metabolic adaptation re uh, response. So they conserve more energy even compared to the same level of massive weight loss as those that, were, uh, uh, that underwent bariatric surgery. So uh, mean it means that exercise may not avoid that. <laughs> yes, yes, very interesting. So um, since I have no questions so far, uh, and given your uh, so I have here a question, a question from uh, uh, my colleague Fatima Batista. Uh, thank you for keeping us uh, with the, the, the uh, technological developments for the assessment of body composition and the explanatory theories of adaptive thermogens. Any technological develop the developments to simplify thermogenesis assessment? That is uh, Professor uh, Fatima Batista question. I think, uh, let's see, any simplified thermogenesis assessment. Uh, I haven't seen anything. Have you, Annalisa? You know, I think that's another great deficit area we have. Of course, we can use indirect calorimetry. It's the simplest exactly. thing. Uh, but what about some of the wearable devices? Uh, uh, what about uh, like heart rate uh, monitoring or things like that? Did that offer any new opportunity for us? Well, if I think that adaptive, adaptive thermogenics, that the resting energy expenditure, if that's the yeah. question, 
uh, only but through indirect calorimetry along with the changes in body composition. Right. But, uh, yeah. If uh, the question is adaptive thermogenesis in other uh, energy compartments, uh, like physical activity, energy expenditure, then, then I think that that would be a, a possibility. The non-exercise activity thermogenesis, right? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm very optimistic. Uh, I, I've seen such major advances in uh, wearable technology. Uh, so, so for I, I'm, I don't want to distract too much, but uh, we're currently testing uh, wearable. Uh, developed by a major company that uh, gives body composition for one thing, it's incorporated into a watch, but it also gives uh, blood oxygen level, EKG, and blood pressure, and other physiological measurements I, I, that I never thought would be possible. So I think uh, as we go forward, uh, there's such a drive to uh, evaluate these things in free living people that I think industry will step up and eventually give us better tools than we have now. Uh, I'm not sure if there's following questions from Fatima. No, uh, no, no thank you. <laughs> thank you for the answer. My question was related with the uh, simplification of the evaluation of thermogenesis particularly sensors of the temperature, for, for example, be, because in your presentation, we, talk, uh, uh, we talked about uh, temperature. Yes. Yes. Um, you mean, let's see if I understand correctly, Annalisa, maybe you can uh, elaborate a little more for me, but uh, basically uh, the relationship <clears throat> between temperature and energy expenditure, is that uh, well, recently we are working in the paper with the group with the, IAEA, uh, the atomic energy with the John Speakman, uh, and he, he, we were <laughs> we are participating in a study that actually observed the, if temperature is associated with obesity uh, and uh, what so far was found and with the energy regulation energy balance regulation and so far they could not find an exact relationship between uh, temperature, environmental temperature and changes over time with uh, the energy balance regulation. So far, even with the lots of adjustments in the models that they, they performed uh, using data from the WLA water, using uh, United States data uh, from, with, with the available data from uh, people who uh, underwent the WLA water technique, so total energy expenditure was actually measured and they couldn't find any, any effect of temperature so far. So I'm not sure. <laughs> There's probably a compensation due to uh, body composition. That's very, very interesting because uh, I'm sure you know Bergman's rule and uh, Allen's rule. These are two classical rules that relate uh, temperature, environmental temperature to animal size and shape. So animals in cold climates tend to be small and round, whereas animals in warm climates, including humans in warm climates, tend to be thin, tall, and have longer extremities related to um, capacity to dissipate heat. And those ideas have been tried to test it many, many times. So the fact that you have human data to look at this is very interesting. Uh, I think there were some early studies showing that there were uh, effects on thermogenesis uh, related to environmental temperature, like in uh, the North Pole or uh, in warm climates. But I think the data is very limited. So I think it's going to be great if you can look at that in more detail. Uh, there's another question here in the, in the chat. Uh, I mentioned the non-exercise activity thermogenesis uh, a, a little bit while ago, uh, and the, the question from João Magalhães uh, is that how valid are the equipment and the current instruments available to public in measuring energy expenditure? I mean, the NEET, especially NEET, the concept that was raised by Levine in the 1990s in the science uh, journal. This is... Uh the NEAT, uh, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. 
and Annalisa. So basically, let, let me see if I understand that. That's the energy you expend, not at, during rest, like basal, and not during exercise. It's all the other energy in between. The uh, delta thermogenic effect as well of food. Right. So uh, can we use activity monitors to uh, quantify that now much better than Levine did uh, many years ago? He used observation. He watched people, I think. Uh, but uh, today we can do that uh, with technology, right? Yes, but uh, from so far, uh, I, I understand that the, the um, how the way the best way to do it so far is by by using total en energy expenditure uh, by doubly lab water, then uh, resting energy expenditure through indirect calorimetry, and also, um, if possible, uh, the the use of indirect calorimetry uh, in the daily physical activity. That would be the best approach and to okay. understand exactly what is exercise from what is not exercise, I would say. I'm not sure if Joao wants to yeah, uh, 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 question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Now, my, my question was uh, a follow-up to Professor Fatima. And uh, the, uh, the whole question was regarding if we're trying to simplify thermogenesis on NEAT itself and we want to bring, bring this to a broader public, and we, I think we actually want some kind of instrument that can measure this kind of... Uh, energy expenditure uh, in a proper way, in a valid way. And, uh, and I think so far we've been struggling a little bit with this uh, measurement itself. And I was just wondering if somehow we have seen an, any kind of development because we've, knew, we've been using uh, accelerometers, we've been using uh, combined sensors, but at this point we still, uh, I think we're still struggling a little bit with measuring energy expenditure. And if uh, in the near future we want to uh, simplify the, this adaptive ther thermogenesis when it comes to needs, I think we kind of need some device or instrument that can measure this uh, uh, parameter properly. So yeah, that's, that's like fascinating. Uh, I think what you mean is outside the laboratory, right? In real world settings, uh, right? Exactly, so we for can... the public, yeah, for, for, yeah, for, that was like for the general public, exactly. Right, we, we can measure in the lab pretty well. You know, if you have ideas, get in touch with me, by the way, uh, because uh, I, ha I have access to pretty high technology uh, developers. And I think that these are very, very important uh, needs. And I, I can't help but think there must be a way to do this. Uh, I, I, I was shocked to find out you can measure blood pressure in a watch. And how do you do that? Uh, so I, they measure, uh, Part of the upstroke on the EKG, they can measure EKG and they measure a, a part of the upstroke on the uh, electrocardiogram on the R R QRS complex. And I never would have thought of that. It's not a perfect way of doing it, but there must be some other body signals we could use that we can capture to uh, estimate energy expenditure much better than we have been. I, I, I'm, I'm certain of it. Uh, no, I just want to just uh, a little, a little uh, add up because the, the our laboratory especially has uh, been part of an European consortium trying to to to, uh, to bring some advances on this uh, on this uh, measuring energy expenditure using uh, these kind of devices for a broader audience. And I was hoping to see if somehow uh, on the other side of the ocean, if there was some kind of advances as well. So thank you, thank you for your answer. No, I, I haven't seen anything uh, specific. Uh, I have a question for Annalisa. The uh, method of using heart rate to estimate energy expenditures. Heart rate so easy to measure today. Anybody can measure it with a watch. Um, the problem with that is you have to calibrate heart rate to oxygen consumption, right? You have to put someone on a treadmill that uh, each individual has a specific relationship of heart rate to energy expenditure. You can't use general equations. Is that the problem? Yes, uh, that is a way to do it. To, to, there is a relationship between heart rate and VO2, which yeah. is stable to some point. It's a stable relationship at some point. And then uh, after the, the threshold, the, some threshold, in, um, an aerobic threshold, then the, this relationship starts to be uh, different. Uh, it's not this, uh, and, and of course, that there is a rate, there is an equation that can be developed for each person between yeah. heart rate and VO2, yes. 
So that, I so, think but, that, that would be important to, uh, I think that that would be a way to also address this issue, right? That you are uh, raising now, the, the idea yeah. that you are raising. Okay. But yes. If I might add, just uh, it, that's something that's for, for instance, for the Acti Art equipment. That's something that we've been doing for uh, for uh, for a little bit of a, uh, for a little bit of time because we've had this kind of calibration for these kind of devices, yeah. Where we had a step or a submaximal, even if you want to a maximum test, where you can actually calibrate the device. But even with that, we 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 still struggle a little bit with predicting uh, uh, energy expenditure uh, when compared, for instance, with with gold standard measures such as. TBW or uh, TBW um, uh, level level water. So yes. Uh -huh. Okay. So now I think uh, I would try to ask you a question directly to uh, one of the methods that uh, you mentioned in your talk, and uh, I would like to hear a little bit more about it because I think it's very useful for sport sports scientists, for sports, uh, for uh, people who are related with exercise, uh, exercise physiologists as well. Uh, and you showed a, a very promising method, uh, the 2D scanner development and the yes. 3D optical scans to be used by, I think, sports scientists, uh, sports science professionals and exercise physiologists in the in field context. That would be a very interesting choice. And I would like to note the accuracy of the predicted body composition that was mentioned there because they, they, were, they are able not only to provide anthropometric measurements, but also to provide these regional estimations of PET and PET3 mass as a pseudo DEXA. And uh, that, that, that is my following, uh, follow, follow up question is the what are the reference methods used and what is the accuracy of these predicted body components? It's a great question. I think that um, uh, typically the devices I've seen so far are calibrated against DEXA as the reference. Okay. And so they develop prediction equations e either from uh, circumferences and lengths or from principal components, ultimately that are referenced against DEXA. And my concern, Annalisa, about that is that we've been through this with bioimpedance analysis. We have a million BIA equations. As you know, you wanted to study this, BIA equations. We can have a million equations for predicting body composition from optical scanning. And so I think um, the field needs to get together in some way and say, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to use standard methods or something. Because how many papers do we need saying the BIA isn't accurate or is accurate? Or it, it's going to be the same thing with optical scanning, because these are uh, empirical equations developed on 20 people or 50 people. Uh, so we need a better way of doing this. Uh, I think that one of the things that would, would help that because the, the, all the, the conclusions are the same, uh, they are good at the, the, at the group level, but at the individual level, there are right. some, fall, some, some problems, uh, yeah. some individual uh, uh, limits that are uh, the, the higher limits of agreement and whatever. But uh, I think the real question uh, also for BIAD devices or equations and also for this the other uh, the 2D scanner that you showed, I think that what we really need is to have reference values for every single measurement that is obtained by this, this different equipment. So if you are working with BIA, if you are working with anthropometric measurements, if you are working with uh, digital scanners, uh, if for each method, you should have a reference standard to, be, to look at. <laughs> This is such a great idea. I think uh, 30 years ago, the field, they tried doing that with BIA, uh, but it, it never went forward. And every manufacturer has a different device, a different number. And so it makes it so hard for people like us to, to really uh, have consistency across our studies. I couldn't agree more. This is a huge problem that maybe we can work together to solve it. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. I really hope so. So uh, I think now, now it's time to uh, end the session. So I would like okay. to acknowledge Professor Stephen Einsfield for the great presentation and for the relevant questions asked by the audience.